All right. Am I coming through? You getting audio? All right, good. All right, so we're starting a little late because some guy from Microsoft kind of talked a little long, so we'll get through that. But uh, but uh, good stuff. How's the conference so far? Half day. Everybody's awake. Had some lunch, sort of. All right. Well, this session is in the expert track, and it's called Building an Internal DSL in C Sharp. Expert being kind of misnomer, let's just say it's really advanced. Uh, my name is Chris Patterson. I am a, uh, I mostly do C Sharp nowadays, but I work in a lot of environments. I've been developing software for about, I don't know, 22 years. I kind of lose track. Um, but I work for a company called Relay Health. Apparently about 20 of you in the room actually are familiar with this company. Um, <laughs> We do uh, healthcare communications, connectivity solutions, and, and uh, billing systems. Um, I blog on Los Techies, as well, at least once in the last year. But um, I'm known on the internet as Fat Boy G, so I'm easily Googleable, which is good because there's three other Chris Pattersons that actually follow me on Twitter that are all software developers. Uh, I work in a variety of open source projects. Uh, Top Shelf is a service hosting framework. Mass Transit is a uh, service bus, and Magnum is a library for the larger than average developer. So it's just kind of the library. Um, I'm also a Microsoft Visual C Sharp MVP, and I was at the summit all week. I'm working on about three hours of sleep, so the fact that I'm standing is really kind of a bonus at this point. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about building, we're going to talk about what DSLs are and how to build them in C Sharp. You know, some, you know, DSLs are domain specific languages. I'll probably get into that, so I'm going to cover some of those details. So I'm going to tell you what they are, you know, what you might use them for. I'm going to tell you how you build them. And then I'll give you some pointers of where you can go after this to kind of get more information and kind of take it to the next level to pull that back into your libraries and frameworks that you might be building. So, DSL is a domain specific language. And there's actually kind of a nice definition for this that's really kind of easy to follow. It's a computer programming language of limited expressiveness focused on a particular domain. So we break that down. It is a computer programming language. This is not something, in my opinion, you're going to give to some person who's not a programmer and let them build a system. Because, you know, we've tried that for, what, the past 20 years and it still hasn't worked? So... But it does give us some expressiveness that is beyond things like function calls and dots and curly braces and angle brackets and you know, let's, let's us display logic and build logic and define behavior in a particular expressive way for a particular domain. The particular domain is important because this is not a general purpose programming language. That's what C Sharp is. That's what Java is. It is a language for expressing a particular domain. So keep that in mind as we go through this discussion. With a domain specific language, there's two ways that these can be built. They can be external, which is a lot of the stuff you see with like later to, I think it's either later today or tomorrow, Allende is doing one of his seven talks on external DSLs, building them with Boo, you know, building something that you take in as a file, compile, and you know, do something from. There's also internal, which I tend to, and I'm going to be talking about today. Um, another way to differentiate these is an external DSL defines a new grammar. You know, so a new syntax, a new format, a new grammar of parsing, you know, that then ultimately results in parsing text and bringing that into, you know, some sort of computer program. Whereas an internal DSL, we're using an existing grammar. In the case of these demonstrations, it's going to be with C Sharp but you can also do it with other languages as well. And turning it into a more expressive way. So we're going to be talking purely about internal DSLs. We're going to cover some pretty extensive framework bits that are both 3.5 and 4.0. So you know, it's going to have, it's going to be a little brain crunching at times. So during this talk, if you're like, hold on a second, I don't get that. Definitely raise your hand and stop me or I'll be done in about 10 minutes and then we can all go to the next session. So. Definitely ask questions as we go along because there's some good information here. And I don't want to just blow through something that I kind of take for granted and someone say, wait, you lost me at angle bracket you know, or something like that. So. so how do we do this? Probably the most common way that internal DSLs are built in C Sharp, at least in my experience, if someone else has a different experience, let me know, is the Fluent interface. Now, the Fluent interface 
is a, I, this is my definition. I, I don't know if anybody else has this definition. But you're essentially like talking to the code. A lot of these kind of read, you know, in, in terms of a, like a common language that you may share with a business person. But it's a conversation consisting of a series of method calls in the same context. So I don't know if I have an example of this. Nope. Okay. So there's a lot of ways that we can do this. Has anybody used a Fluent interface before? How many of you used Fluent in Hibernate? Okay, so you're, you, you understand from that experience what I'm talking about. Um, you're not talking about, you know, canoeing up an object and setting a bunch of properties and calling an API call. We're talking about something that's much more descriptive than if you were reading through the code that you might easier grasp what the essence of that piece of code is trying to do versus looking at properties and reading API docs and things of that nature. So, so one of the ways that fluid interfaces have been built is a process called method chaining. Let me see if I can jump out here. Yeah, we're on this slide that says demo. So what is method chaining? Let me this full screen. It's kind of weird because I feel like I'm kind of like coming out in the crowd and I'm going to start like crowd surfing or something. So it's a little kind of weird for me. Um, so method chaining. Can I, before we go too far, and you're probably already reading it, but... Method chaining. Does anybody have a good example of method chaining in the framework today? Link, yes. Link. Link is like the epitome of all method chaining. It, it's this expressive query language, which you have two ways of doing it. You can do the friendly query. Or does anybody have like the official name for that? The select from where in? I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay. So that thing, that's... <laughs> That doesn't look like method chaining, although if you unwrap that, or if in ReSharper you say alt enter convert to a method chain, it ends up being a series of calls on something that is returned. So when we talk about method chaining, let's say that I have a collection. I'm going to get the solution explorer out of the way. Let's say we have a collection of product, because product, can anybody read that in the back? Awesome. So in the link style, Let's, I'm going to go from product, and I'm going to say where manufacturer is Rossum. You know, let's say we want some products from Rossum Corporation. Of course, we all know those, those would be dolls. But, you know. No dollhouse fans, really? Come on. All right, one. All right, good. All right, so Link is like the first, I don't, I don't want to say it was like the, it was probably the first widely available method chaining type implementation that we saw in the .NET framework. I can't really think of another one, but... Yeah, jQuery, jQuery does some, yeah, it does method chaining, yeah, in the same, similar ways, yes, so. Um, so there's a number of things we can do, and the way that the compiler does this, or the language does this, is it just uses a thing called extension methods. So we have to start with a type. We have some sort of extension method that defines a verb or whatever type of language you want to define in that type, and then it returns, you know, the collection of whatever comes out. In the case of a where clause, which is just a filter, it returns the same type of product. In the case of a select, which can transform the inbound collection into another collection, we're actually changing what's coming out. So we have a lot of flexibility there when we do our chains. Um, so, and we can define these ourselves. So if we wanted to make our code a little bit more reusable, or let's say that we always wanted to check to see if a manufacturer was Rossum, we could actually create our own extension method to do that. Let me make sure I didn't already do this. Yeah. So we could actually say, you know, public static class, my extensions, because every good class name starts with my. And we would have a public you know, in this case, I enumerable of product, public static, sorry. And we could call it just say, is Rossum. You know, let's say that this is checking something like is a, you know, some sort of discount capable type little business logic or some rule. And we look at that collection. St extension methods are highly distinguishable because they have the this as the beginning of the first parameter. And we can literally just return 
products where and because of the way method chaining works I can now use that extension method here instead and say result equals products dot is rossum and it's semantically equivalent of the where, it's going to do the same thing. The compiler is going to infer it, and by the time it hits the code that's actually generated, it's going to be exactly the same lines of code. But it gives me a little more discoverability. I don't see the mess of, you know, if this was a where clause that had 15 different things in it, I'm able to create something that gives me a little more readable information when I'm looking at it versus trying to determine that, oh, yes, this is our algorithm to determine that this product is hazardous and can only be shipped ground. So, and that kind of goes into a whole pattern discussion, but it gives us some readable information so that we can learn rather than trying to guess. And because it's done with an extension method, we can apply it to a number of different types. So, let me see what I got here. Little screen. So we use these extension methods. I kind of quote one of the solid principles of open for extension, close for modification, because we didn't have to modify our products collection to add that language to the system. Whether it really did that is kind of a question, because it's not really there. But simple extensions. You know, we did one called is rosm to check the product. But you could also do some clever things with construction of objects. You know, one of the common uses that I see of uh, these type of extension methods is allowing us to use language to, def to create items that are particular to a domain. You know, if you're building a cookbook app and you want to be able to, or some sort of cooking control system, and you need to be able to load values in, I could extend int with an extension method called ounces that creates a new type of measure and returns that so that I can cast it rather than saying new measure and passing 47 and wondering, you know, do I go look at the help? Do I look at the arguments? Do I have to new up an ounces and then pass it to a new measure? It gives us some interesting ways to create and use values in our domain such that when we're looking at the code, we can kind of better see what it's doing versus seeing all the noise of the language and newing up everything. Another one, another real common use of this is things like duration. What is seven? Okay, I have a duration of seven. This annoys me a lot about like a lot of the runtime libraries. They'll have like a sleep and they take a int or they take a long. And we know when we look at the SDK documentation that, oh, it's milliseconds that's being passed in and I passed a one. I should have passed a 1,000 to get a one second pause. Well, through use of some clever extension methods, we can create something like seven minutes that returns a time span so that we can actually read this in our code and say, oh, now when I'm looking at it and I see sleep for seven minutes, I don't have to guess. It's pretty much being told to me in my face how it's being done. Or, and you can also, like if I needed to create a date time, and we do this a lot when we're trying to figure out like durations for delays, if I need to know when something is due, I can say five days or five, seven minutes from now. And what that does under the covers, I don't care, because I'm just reading it out. It's, it's about making it fluent to understand quickly what it's doing. You know, I also have a bunch of them for, like, days, weeks, business days, and you can load, like, calendar strategies to say, okay, well, holidays are automatically covered for, and so you can do a number of different creational things there and put some strategies in there for determining how, you know, what our business calendar is so that we skip weekends. So we say if you're going to get your product 10 business days from now, you can do that kind of stuff, too. So what do these look like? I think that was a, a typo. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's because slides don't compile, and so I can't verify that the language syntax is correct. Yeah, but I was returning a timestamp. But yes, if I had returned an object with that property, I could do that. And you, 
And I've seen some people kind of massage the types that are returned so that they return kind of a more explicit domain type and they add those properties on. The problem is then it kind of pollutes your actual domain with the language that you really don't need. You know, the essence of it is that it's a time span. If you, like, derive from time span and add a bunch of properties, you're just kind of making a lot of noise in your domain when really this is for more about writing code that uses your library or whatever functions are in your domain versus cluttering it up with a bunch of configuration stuff. So I think I have a date time sample. And yeah, you can see here, from now actually has the parentheses. So, you know, the duration of seven seconds or an expiration 15 seconds from now. And seconds is an extension method on int. From now is an extension method on time span. So you're able to load these in and use them, again, without cluttering up your classes with a lot of configuration glue. And so when I look at something like set timeout 12 seconds, I don't have to guess and say, is that, should that be 12,000 or is it microseconds or any of that kind of stuff. So it really gives you some greater readability. And I think that extension method is right down here. So seconds, it says this int as the input and returns the time span. And it's just doing a time span not from seconds. And, you know, that could be enough for a lot of things, too, is just time span from seconds, but then you're reading backwards. It's time span from seconds five versus five seconds. So it's just these weird little things that kind of jack with our head. And besides, this is cool, right? You know, it's much cooler. So another way that these extension methods can be used, and does anybody do any Scala programming? Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, that one never goes over well. Um, Scala has a really cool language feature called traits, which essentially allow you to add behavior to objects at runtime or at, um, at instantiation time versus declaration time. So like instead of in the class def, you can actually merge functionality in. You can do something very similar with .NET to give you some interesting features. For instance, just knowing, just having the compare to method, which is in the .NET framework, it's a member of the iComparable interface you can derive a lot of comparison operators from just that one method. So since an integer is comparable, and compare to has this particular rule, it says, okay, I, I'm going to return zero if we are equal to another one of my own type. I'm going to return less than one if I am less than, and I'm, or less than zero, and I'm going to return greater than zero if I am greater than. So from that, we can infer less than, Less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, you know, all of those different types of rules. Well, through extension methods, we could add behavior based on a particular interface that an object has to have, and we can add our own types of language to extend those classes. So, for instance, value.compare to greater than zero, it might be a little tough for me to go and look and say, oh, yeah, you know, the help says that when it's greater than zero, Whereas if I can just write extension methods to, to capture that rule or behavior in a language that I can see. So when I go to greater than, I can just say int left equals 12 and int right equals 47. And I can say, like, if 12 is greater than 47. Of course, I would probably use variables because I'd be taking data in. But those are ints. These are decimals. You know, decimals supports that same I comparable. So I can compare them as well. Or in the case of here, if right is greater than left. So it just gives us a little bit of, you know, niceness so that we can understand stuff. Of course, the language has operators. Sometimes those are better, but you know, just an example. Yeah, like let's say you had an application where you have to place order lines in a particular order so that they're charged correctly. Yes. Yeah. If you had a yeah, like if I had a measurement for recipe, if two cups is greater than one cup, kind of thing. Yeah. And just by implementing I comparable on that measurement, I could then use it with any of these. So yeah, that's a good point. And you may determine, you may use that for like if you were trying to see if you need to go shopping. You know, do I have enough sugar? Well, do I have enough? No, I don't. Okay. So there's always some fun stuff there. So that's extension methods. Um, any questions on the extension methods before I move on to a little bit more interesting <laughs> ones? We already talked about link. Okay. 
So we talked about link, and who uses link to and hibernate? Okay. One thing that I found really interesting about some of the uh, about link is, you know, you get your where clauses and you get your select clauses to pull which data you want, but then you have to do something else. You have to either say like to list or to array, or basically you have some ending method which signifies that, hey, I'm ready to go talk to the database now. You know, essentially you have to say, to list. Otherwise, what you have is just a promise to query something later when you actually access it. That's one of the great things about Link is it's lazy. But when it's time to do work, we have to actually tell it, oh, I need you to do something now. So to list is one of those examples. I think that there's a better way to do this when you're building a DSL. Yeah, that's kids today. Huh? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> My ears. <laughs> um, so there's a. You know, link has its benefits, and you can do some interesting things with method chaining. You know, kind of the you know the whole are we done thing here is. Oh, let me get this piece of code here because I'm not finding it. So there's some issues with method chaining because you always have to have like a finisher. You know, you have to have the two list or two array. If you were defining a DSL to do something, the last thing you want to do is say, okay. Here's my different commands in my DSL, and I want to now create something. I just I think it's noisy. So what I have instead is remember how I said the three hours of sleep thing? Yeah, it's hitting me about right now. So um, there's this concept of a nested closure. Who knows how to use lambda methods in C sharp? Who's seen the lambda methods? You've seen them in link. We had a few in there with like the where clause. Um, nested closure is a term when describing a DSL syntax of how you can capture the scope of particular operation or essentially pass a method into some sort of, of configuration method that says, and since you're passing a function, that function has an entry and an exit. So when that function ends, I know implicitly that you're done configuring something and you want to now execute that. It, it works very similar to method chaining, but essentially I'm saying, okay, start configuration and end configuration by putting it inside of a method versus just letting them continuously chain on the end of, a, of some sort of return type. So I'm going to cruise through this. Okay, so I have a big example here, and we've got plenty of time to finish it, so... Because we're till 2.45. Okay, so any questions just in general about DSLs before we get into the code? Because this is where it, it starts to get a little deeper. Okay. Um, so we have the need to build some sort of DSL that allows us to validate data. Now, this may be data that comes back as part of, like, a model in MVC. You know, you get a, you know, someone posts a form back and you get a class back with a bunch of members on it. And so we're going to build a validation library that has a DSL to allow us to configure it. So how might this look? You know, if we start from the initial what I want to test, I should be able to create a validator. And what this is is our first unit test. I should be able to create a validator for a class. So from the syntax that I want to create for this validator, I want to say validator.new because I'm defining a new validator, and I'm going to pass in the generic type that I want to validate. In this case, it's an order. And this nested closure is the piece right here. You know, essentially the x, whatever we're going to end up calling that equals greater than operator. I don't know what that's ever going to be called, but uh, I think Scott Hanselman wants to rename it something that has to do with his name, but I don't think that's going to happen. What? <laughs> Is this the junior high class? What is with this? It's the Gazinta. <laughs> Wait a minute, that doesn't even work well with that. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to define a validator that does nothing. 
I'm just saying, hey, I have a validator for order, but I don't want to do anything. I've not defined any conditions. And my one unit test of that is I'm going to take an order, which in this case I'm just going to pass null, and I'm going to call validator.validate. And everything should work. Well, we would hope so. Um, I'm not going to bother running this test because we know it will work. But it's not going to do anything. But the key thing is here is how we've kind of set up this construction syntax for a validator. We have something called validator. Now, I will, I will pull a disclaimer up first because I did Java before I did .NET, and I don't like like using the singular interface names. I don't like say I validate because I think that's kind of weird. So my interfaces will not have eyes in front of them. So don't freak out. They're a different color at least. But some people don't like that. I do because when I see like I validator and validator, I think of C++ and header files and that kind of scares me. So, so we're going to start walking through this code a little bit. And we're going to start with this validator because that's kind of like the first piece of code we see that's, okay, this is part of our DSL. And what validator is, is it's a static class. And it has a generic method on it called new. Does, every, does everybody at least somewhat familiar with generics? Have an idea? Okay, good. If you don't, there's a chapter in the book. <laughs> it's essentially allows us, instead of just passing object or some untype unboxed reference, is just use my type. And I'm passing an action, which is a special type in the library, it says action of validator configurator is a, it expects a method that takes one parameter of validator configurator. And that can be an anonymous method, which can be defined with a lambda expression, or you can pass an actual method into this. It doesn't care. But that just gives it that reference to that method. And what that does, it allows the call of new to scope the execution of that method within its own call. So it's not like it's going to return something back to you that then you're then going to call into. So for this case, it's actually going to new up the actual type validator configurator for the given type that you've specified and then call your configure method with that configurator. It's then going to call configurator.createValidator to return you your actual validator. So that's kind of our start. Now, right now, we're not defining any validation rules, but what is this configurator? This configurator is a class that implements the validator configurator interface that the configuration method requires. And it has a little bit of data in it. You'll see that, first of all, it has a constructor and it moves up a list of other configurators. So this validator is highly nested, so it gets a little weird. But the only method on there is add configurator. And the add configurator, the create validator, the first thing it does is validate configurators. And there's a lot of ors in here. Validators, configurators, builders. Yeah, it gets kind of crazy. But we validate configurators. And then we create a builder. You know, when you think about creational patterns, builder is something that gets the information it needs to do to then ultimately build or create some sort of class for you. So we create a builder. And then we execute all those configurators against that builder. Now. I've created a lot of DSLs, and I've done it probably four different ways. And some of the ways are a little scary. Let me see if I can find some of those ways. One of the, one of the first ways that I saw a lot of people create them, let me see if I have a test here. Yeah, I don't think I have any. OK. So, one of the ways that I used to use just pure method chaining to create configurate to create any sort of DSL was I created this some sort of configurator class that would build this for me. And you can see here with this configurator, I'm saying result equals new configurator for customer Johnson for user Bill. You know, essentially I'm I've defined these methods that capture pieces of data, you know, for customer and for Bill. And these just literally, this configurator was just kind of like a bag. <coughs> It just stored the values that you specified. And then when it came time to create the result, it created, it just newed up the object and passed it the parameters. And while it seemed to have kind of a fluent flow to it, it really was just like, this, this just seems kind of weird. Because I wasn't really, it wasn't really getting anything from it. It was kind of like, well, why, why am I doing this fluent interface stuff? This just seems weird. I'm just creating a class and setting a bunch of properties on it and then calling create. It really was, it was, it was kind of like, I just, 
I didn't get the value out of it. And, and a lot of the fluent interfaces I saw in the early days really kind of did this kind of stuff. You know, and so instance, when it came time to create, then they would go through and validate all those values, make sure they were right, or they would validate them when you set them. You know, one of the things that I tried after that was, okay, well, I'll make my setters on my builder class throw exceptions if you set something that's out of range so that it's not like I create the object and it blows up on the constructor, but it blows up in the builder, and then if the builder's all, everything's all right in there, it would create the object. That got messy, too, because I ended up with, like, half-created objects that allocated resources and, you know, may have, you know, accessed pages or open files or something, and then I had to unroll that and open, and, you know, basically it's just like I, sh I wanted to fail as quickly as possible before starting to allocate resources. So I went away from this approach after a couple of different iterations because it just kept causing me more pain than it was worth. So, and that's where I came up with the... Uh, came up with this more approach here. And what I did is configuration is a different concern than building and ultimately creating some sort of object, whether it's, a, you know, in this case it's a validator, but whatever you might be creating. Configuration has its own set of rules to, to specify, you know, how you want things to operate. Whereas the builder, once we get to that point, we should know that we're going to succeed. Essentially, we want to guarantee that we're going to succeed at creating the object and it's not going to matter on whether they've specified a piece of data. So the configurator in this case is responsible for collecting that information. Once the information is collected, we validate that information. And assuming validation passes, we then create the builder that will ultimately build the final object that we need. So here, that's essentially what we're getting with this. We're newing up this type validator configurator. All he does is know about more configurators, verifies that they are correct, and then builds the ultimate output validator that we want. So let's find one that's a little bit more involved. You know, let's say we want to verify that our order is actually not null. So in this case, I've added an extra line to the definition of my validator. I've said x dot not null. Now, not null is an extension method. It's an extension method on the validator configurator. And the reason this is an extension method is because validators are kind of one of these weird extensible things. We always come up down the line with a new type that we need to be able to validate. You know, we put in initial support for strings and numbers and decimals. And then we realize we add a new property that we haven't created a way to validate for. You know, we don't validate a reference type to make sure that it's not null or something. So I wanted to make sure that this DSL could be extended beyond the initial definition of it. So not null is an extension method because in designing this, I wanted to make sure that I was essentially dogfooding my own internal code so I didn't have like some validation rules that were higher class citizens than the ones that could be created to extend the framework. So what we have is for each validation rule that we can define, we'll have a configurator and a builder for that configuration rule. So in this case, not null is going to, when you say you want, you know, this can be not null, it's going to create a not null configurator and add it to that host configuration. And by the way, all this code is available free to download and extend and mess with and use in your apps. So. Don't, you don't have to write all this down or like take pictures of it. So the not null configurator, all it does is have one method on it called configure, which takes in that builder. And for that builder, he says, okay, well, we're at the point of building the object, so I'm going to new up the actual validator and then add it to the builder so that it can be ultimately added to that class that goes back. So it starts to cascade up the hit list. And not null validator is actually very simple. If value is null, return a, validate, a violation saying this violates the rule of you know, the validator. So we're not throwing an exception because if we do a lot of things wrong, we'd like to get all those errors. You know, when you submit an HTML form and you leave name blank, you don't want to hit, oh, name, enter. Oh, last name, too, enter. Oh, oh address, too, enter. You want to get all the violations back. So it essentially returns a list 
You know, it can return one or more or whatever. It uses the yield syntax because I don't know how many I'm going to get if I have multiple statements, and I don't want to just return like an empty collection. Yield kind of handles that for us. So it's saying if the value is null, return violator, uh, violation. It's saying it can't be null. So that's, that's not null. Hold on. No, I don't want to change that. So here, where I've defined not null, now when order equals null, I'm should, I expect to get back, and I'm using nUnit here to write these unit tests, so when I execute these, when I call validator.validate, I expect to get back a list of violations, and then I should get a count of one. And apparently I typed a strange character somewhere, because I'm getting a weird error. I don't know. So when I run that test, it passes because when I I'm passing in a null order and the validator is returning that one violation that order is null. And that was kind of a leap, really, because, I mean, I just hit a key and something happened. So, yes, sir? Because it's not as cool? <laughs> because I, I may have multiple rules in here. You know, I just, I, it was more of a consistency thing in how the different ones that I implemented worked. But I was returning an enumerable, again, a link-compatible type, and I was just using yield because I could have returned, because otherwise I would have had to say, if it equals null, return something. Otherwise, return enumerable dot empty of the type, so that I returned essentially an empty collection. And I could have done that, but I didn't. This is cooler. It shows yield. Neat. Um, this was kind of a leap. So, I mean, this thing that just happened to magically happen. So, who wants an F10 trace? Do we want to go into the F10 trace, or is that too much? Okay. Is that a yes or a no? Who wants to see us trace through this code? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> uh huh. First of all, we'll, we'll, we'll exclude the CSLA discussion because that's like a big monster. But, um, actually, it would, it, it's, I think it's probably lighter weight than CSLA because I've seen how the business object stuff actually does all their validation, and it's, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> this ends up with a very lightweight class that just calls through a bunch of essential if statements. So performance-wise, if statements would be quicker because ultimately they get inlined, but then you've got to cut and paste that code everywhere. And as soon as you start extracting methods and putting those into validation methods, you might as well go here. Because you're, you're then, you just end up creating a static class with a bunch of validator methods or an I validator with a dozen different methods to validate each data type. And that just, it doesn't scale when you start to put validation into hundreds of web pages and hundreds of forms in a, in a data entry type application. So that's, that's my response to that one. So there are a few other tests in here yeah, um, that support a couple of different other things. Uh, we won't cruise through all those, but they're in the code if you want to kind of see how they're there. Um, so the next one is, assuming I have an order that's not null, I want to check that the order ID property of an order, so we're getting to a little bit more advanced validators here. I'm saying, okay, for the property of order ID on the order, I want to make sure it's not empty and not null. Now, this is a little more involved because I'm essentially referencing an attribute of some class, you know, a member of it. I'm not checking if the root is null. But if the root is not null, I want to check to make sure that this property has a value. And I want to make sure that it's not empty or not null. And I realize these are pretty simplistic checks. So here I create up an order. The actual order ID is null. It'll create an error. It'll be empty. It'll create an error. Or if it actually has the right stuff, it won't create any errors. 
So you're able to chain these rules out because here, property is another one of these extension methods because all these rules are started with an extension method. But instead of just saying not empty, here I'm actually returning a property configurator. If you'll notice from the not null check, which was... Somewhere. I jumped through too many files, I think. Oh, wait a minute. That's so silly. Here, I was re returning what I was passed in because there's no additional configuration for not null. You know, I'm just saying, hey, if it's not, it's not null. Yeah, I could define and chain additional ones on there like not null, not empty. But with the property, I'm saying, you want to reference a property that's part of my class and then do checks on that property. Well, one of the things that really kind of makes this useful is I want to use a lambda function to specify the property. I don't want to put quotes a name because that breaks. That's some magic string that somewhere deep in a piece of code just doesn't work once we change the name of a property. So where we've defined that, which is actually in the not null specs, I'm using a lambda expression with the rule definition to say I want to reference the order ID in that class. So if we look at the signature of this, it's saying, I want, some, I want you to give me some expression that takes an order and returns a string. In this case, it's a string because it's inferring the type from the property that's on that interface. And from there, I actually create an object property configurator, which has a little different behavior. Because one of the things I wanted to get is I didn't want to have to ultimately put that string somewhere so that I could display in my error message that order ID is null. So by using expressions, which is another nice feature of .NET 3.5 and beyond, I'm able to capture information about that, about that lambda method. And for instance, here I capture that whole property expression. And for the message that gets output, I can look at that actual expression and return the member name of that property so that I don't have to like hard code a type or do any type of weird stuff or just in worst case put the name in string because then it gets stays coupled to that. So then I get the real member name. So when errors come out and I come down here, where's my property? Order, order ID equals A. Yeah. Isn't that going? And so it, it, it basically says that the order ID cannot be empty, and it includes that order ID property name in there. So I had a better description there. I had a better test for me. So here's the better test for that. Essentially, that the string that I'm going to get back now, because I have an order and an order ID, is I want order dot order ID, and this is the expression. This is the violations I get back. Because if I'm putting this in like an MVC website, and I have a form on the screen, I want to be able to map this so I know which field to put into the um, model state. Yeah, the model state dot add error. I need to be able to pass the field ID that's got the problem so that it can display the error right aligned with the proper form. So by using the expression tree, I'm able to get the name, and I'm actually able to reflect over the model properly so that I can generate that name so you don't have to guess or explicitly bind that. Because in your if case, you'd say if this dot that is empty, then you'd have to say add state, and you'd have to put a string and everything in there, and you start building that up and hope it doesn't change and hope it doesn't break. So again, using the power of the expressions to not have to do that. So Because that's what... MVC is doing. It's getting that from some type of expression, hopefully if you're using nice HTML output fields. So
So one of the other things that we get with this over the if-then statement is we get nestability. So if I have a customer validator and I want to know that for a customer that it can't be null and the name of the customer must not be null or empty and an order must have a customer and I want to validate the customer that comes in with that order using that other validator, I'm able to nest and kind of chain those together and kind of nest that stuff in there. I could have defined that in line if I wanted to, but I can get these validators. The other benefit of that is if I register a validator of T in my IOC container, when my method comes up, I can just pull that out of the IOC container by the type and then call that validator and all the bindings just wire up. So something to think about if you start digging into the whole dependency injection IOC kind of metaphor. So. And it's getting warm in here. It's cold this morning. So the key thing of how these DSLs are built, and again, this is based on how I've tried this several different times to build these, is making them extensible, because as your domain evolves, you don't want to go change all the code that's already there. Um, extension methods give us that. Um, using this configurator builder result approach versus just having these classes that collect a whole bunch of bags of data and then somehow combine it into a single thing. Or, and, um, and one of the other essences, extension methods are kind of weird. Since they're not actually on the type that you're on, you have to actually use the namespace to get that feature. So for instance, I created one extension in here that does a regular expression. And since regular expressions are kind of an advanced feature that not everybody understands, I didn't necessarily want this to show up immediately. So in the, you know, if, so what I, what you can do is by using namespaces, you can, you can essentially make the, the barrier of entry for somebody using like a library that you're creating in your application or a framework a little easier to approach because Good or bad, developers are somewhat IntelliSense driven. You know, you type a class and you hit dot and you expect all your options to show up there. Well, if a hundred options show up, that, that can be a little overwhelming if you're doing, you know, trying to learn something. It's like, well, what do I call? By using namespaces and putting the more advanced features in your DSL into a nested namespace, such as in this case I've called it advanced, you kind of reduce that IntelliSense noise. So that you kind of, you know, these are the things that are most commonly used. If you're an advanced user, use that namespace and it'll bring them in. So without advanced included, the matches operator never shows up because it just, it, it doesn't know what it is. If I come down here on the property and tell ReSharper to go away, if I come down here and hit dot, matches is not one of my choices. All I have is like contains, ends with, not empty, not null, starts with you know, standard type of validation rules. It's only when I bring in advanced that I see matches showing up in the list. So you can use namespaces to kind of create increasing levels of difficulty within your DSLs to kind of limit the initial view of that. So that's something that I've also found that's extremely useful. You know, there's also examples of like collections must have, you know, the validated widths. You know, there's a few things in here. I'm not going to go over all the features of this validation library because it's, it's more about how to create the DSL versus how to use it before, versus what it actually does. But it is a nice validator for validating MVC data in case you put it. Not that I've used it anywhere, but yeah, just an idea. Um, so. Here. So expressions, we covered how we can use the expressions feature to get access to like the members and the properties and the things that are actually being used. Um, a lot of times when you hear talk, especially if you read one of the books that I recommend, a DSL should really be a way to configure some, configure, you know, a piece of functionality in your system, whether it's a validation engine or whatever. Um, the semantic model 
is is it's almost like a domain model. For, well, I guess it is a domain model for your DSL. You have you have you know the validation system that we were trying to build. But if I had put all these starts with, end widths, and configuration stuff right in there with my DSL, it creates a whole lot of code that's really unrelated to actually being a DS, to being a validator. And the semantic model rule says that I should be able I should be able to create the same functionality without using the DSL. And that's where some of my early approaches failed, was that I just kind of included the configuration stuff right in there with the, with the actual model that actually ran the validation. And it ended up with just really noisy classes with a lot of weird methods returning this and doing a lot of things to support method chaining that, that really just polluted the actual essence of validating with a whole bunch of configuration stuff to specify how stuff should be validated. So, a semantic model basically says that I should be able to new up the semantic model just with new statements and call build and get my class without having to use the fluent DSL. So when you're designing these, keep, be sure to keep that separation clear. If you base it off the example that I've shown, that builder is the semantic model. And the configurator is just what tells the builder how to work. So you keep that separation there. Um, I don't know what that means. So, <laughs> um, so we're kind of to the now what. Any questions before I do the now what part? Although the now what's like one slide, so it's not super exciting. Um, uh, it sounds like what you're saying with the semantic model is that the way that you build up configuration for the DSL should be different from the way that you specify your value to your configuration. So, the DSL should configure what ultimately creates your code. It shouldn't be required to use the DSL. Because if you, ha if, you, if you take a DSL and put it to an intermediate model, you should be able to take that intermediate model and serialize it to disks for it so it's faster or something. I mean, there's, there's some nuances there. It's, it's really about separating the definition of what you're validating from all the fluent glue that, that creates that definition. The fluent glue is a way to create the definition, but you should also just be able to new up the definition. So, and it's really about a separation of the configuration versus making it part of like your internal domain for validation. So, yes sir. Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, like I said, I work on a few open source projects, and one of the projects I work on has a, um, a fluent DSL for defining a state machine. So essentially defining protocols for communication between systems. We use a state machine to do that. So one use case of this DSL, and is that font big enough or do I need to make it bigger? Did you say bigger? A little bigger? I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> There we go. That's bigger. Um, so this is, again, the same kind. This is an application of that same DSL. Why would I just do? Oh, it's like the cursor. I have been using computers for more than a couple of days. It doesn't show, though. Um, so in this case, this is a state machine workflow, and it's being defined using the same type of approach that we saw with the validator. I'm calling new, I'm passing a couple parameters to define the types that I'm passing in, and I'm using that fluent DSL to configure the state machine. So in this case, I'm saying, in my model, where I'm storing the data, you can access the current state of a particular instance of the workflow using this member variable. So I'm basically passing that. And then I'm saying initially, you know, when the workflow instance is created, when I receive a start event, I'm going to transition to running. And if I receive a stop event, I'm going to transition to stop. During running, when I'm interrupted, I'm going to cancel any pending request. If I'm told to stop, I'm going to cancel all pending requests, and I'm going to transition to stop. During stopped, if I'm told to restart, I'm going to transition to running. And when I'm disposed, I'm going to finalize and shut down. So essentially, this DSL is being used to define the behavior of a state machine in a way that isn't a diagram in a work play visual designer tool that ultimately compiles down to code. You're writing the code, and then from this we can actually project out a visualization that shows a state transition diagram. 
not really talking about that. <laughs> um, you can have, uh, in this particular system, you can have child workflows of parent workflows, yes, but that's really kind of not. The <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, so that's defining that. Yes, sir? So this would be the configuration part of this. This is the configuration. The model that this configured is completely separate. And then, and then you can run that model. But can you, you can serialize that model too? That model actually, when, when I have that model, it actually stores instances in a database and binds one all, and that's, but the data, this is just defining the behavior, you know, separate from the data. But the definition of the behavior is separate than the actual semantic model of the behavior. The semantic model of the behavior here is a collection of states and events and state event maps and other things that have no DSL code whatsoever in it. Another example of this, if I can figure out how to use my computer again, is... Uh-huh. Okay, I ex exactly see what you're saying. And this, this particular configuration was meant to use chaining because it's very visual basic friendly, which doesn't support nested lambdas. So this, w this was designed to work with VB, which I hear it's being discontinued. No, I don't know. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was cold, I know. The difference is like you can search and replace like five letters and it's C sharp, it's VB. It's all the same. Um, so what I'm doing here is when I say when, when actually creates a new scoped configurator and returns that scoped configurator, but it inherits from the initial configurator because it has a reference to it. So essentially, it's, it's just extending the configurator, and I did that so I wouldn't have to do it during running then, during running when, during running when, otherwise it just doesn't read nicely. It's, I wanted to be able to scope that out. So when you call when here, this when, the, the class that's returned from this when which I think I can show that type if I, oh, I, I'm not in ReSharper on that one. The class that's returned from this when also implements the class that's returned from during, or the interface that's returned from during. So if, you, if, if it sees an additional when, because extension methods are based on interfaces and they follow anything implemented by that class or that interface, it'll make those other extension methods visible. Right, or changing the behavior. And that's why in this case, we actually vi visualize that as a state transition diagram so you can verify your work. You know, basically show my work, project it to a visualization. Well, I think it's, it, kind of, it seems like kind of a, it's one of those things you should think about carefully if you're designing your own DSL and whether you go in this route. Right. The nested closure approach, which really explodes out with a bunch of curly braces, which is, again, why we supported the chaining as well, is here I'm saying initially when start, transition to running and I'm capturing each type at each level. So it's really just two ways of, instead of returning a scoped configurator that can they chain on, you're basically passing the scoped configurator in and it executes it within the scope of that when block versus just returning it back out. So just some subtle nuances. This code is actually in another project of mine if you want to look at it. It's much more involved. Uh, it's called stacked. I'll give you links to all that stuff. I said it's a library for the larger than average developer. It's a garbage bucket. It's the kitchen sink. It's collection tools. It's, you know, wrappers around untype safe or unthread safe collections, things like that. It's, um, there's a whole bunch of reflection tools in there to reflect across expressions and create visitor pattern stuff based on reflection rather than messy code. So it's, uh, it's just a whole bunch of tools. It's a garbage bucket. It's where we put all the stuff that we don't want to cut and paste into every single open source project. So. Uh huh. Um. Yes, I, I know people. 
Yeah, I've seen some stuff like that. I've seen where people have exposed script sources with like Iron Ruby to use Ruby, which lets you create much cleaner DSLs than this and run them against C sharp code. Um, the usages of that for us are kind of weird, but you know, I would almost push that to external because if I mean if you're going all the way to Ruby, that's not exactly using the C sharp semantic model, so or the C sharp grammar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stuff that you can do with Ruby, like with the Ruby test frameworks, where everything just reads very nice, like RSpec and stuff. That's that's pretty cool. I know people doing RSpec against .NET, but it's it's cumbersome and it adds a little bit of slowness to it, which you know I I'm not a big fan of, but I know people that are doing it very well and very happy with it. So, but yeah. Well, method chaining or nested closure, anything that stays within C sharp, because it's using the existing grammar of C sharp and just defining a more expressive format for it. So, um, wrapping up since we've got like one minute left. And Sean will probably tell me I have none minutes left. Um, there is a book. It is a very thick book. But it is by the very intelligent man, Martin Fowler, and his uh, one of his other thought workers, Rebecca Parsons. It's called Domain Specific Languages. It is a great book. I got the ebook because I can't read this at once, and I'm certainly not going to carry it with me. But this covers in depth how to build DSLs, both internal and external. And it's nice because it's broken into three sections. It's broken into like a narrative, which is written in the first person, which really says why some of this stuff was done. It then goes into the how, and then it kind of goes into a reference section of how some of these things are built. So it's, it's got a real nice compositional structure, so you can read different parts of it depending upon what mood you're in, versus whether you're just making one or like learning some of the nuances. Highly recommend this book. Um, examples out there, Fluent and Hibernate, at least half the room threw up their hands on that one. I don't know how they built their DSL internally, but you know, I'm sure they've done a pretty good job because it's pretty handy. They've used a lot of inheritance, like class map of T inherits from class map, and so they've pulled a lot of stuff in to scope the language through inheritance. Um, I won't say tomato, tomato, but they're just different approaches to building that. Um, structure map, Jeremy Miller's uh, inversion of control container, has an extensive fluent DSL. And he actually has a couple videos online that you can watch that show the reasoning of how he's created his stuff. So if you just go out there and search for, like, Jeremy Miller DSL presentation, you should find one. If not, email me, and I'll send you a couple links to him. Um, any questions? <laughs> we already kind of had some, so. But I will be around for a little bit longer if you guys want to uh, hit me up afterwards or hit me up with any questions. If not, enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the web tomorrow as well. That's my contact info if you want to get in touch with me.